Um, with that, um, I'll just uh, you know kind of welcome uh, Lisa. She's our labor economist covering the state's north central region, and she joins us from her office in Lewiston. Uh, Lisa, tell us what drew you to explore small business, and what have you uncovered for us today? Good morning, everybody. So small business is kind of near and dear to my heart. You know, here in Lewiston, I'm in one of the smallest metropolitan areas in the nation, and we are surrounded by small business. That's the norm rather than than large business. And I think I also was was highly drawn to this topic because it, it gets a lot of press and it's in the news a lot, but it's really hard to define and maybe even harder to get really good data on uh, at times. And so that combination kind of made me go, let's let's dive in. And I decided to go with the smallest businesses. So really this webinar is going to be focusing on those employers with fewer than five employees. So really, really small ones. Um, so it, it, I hope you guys kind of take away just how, how much they produce in our economy, but also that there's a lot of blind spots in trying to see some of these uh, businesses as well for us. So with that, I'm going to kind of get in. We're going to start with very basics here because make sure we're talking the same page of what is a small business. And the reason I'm starting with this is you would think it would be a really easy answer, but it's not. Um, it depends who you talk to. If you're looking at the tax code, if you're talking to the SBA, um, the SBA in general actually has, you see the general 500 employees, right? That's what you hear. Uh, but when you go look at the SBA, actually, it's industry specific. And so there's some industries um, such as um, wholesalers where they consider small business kind of 100 to 250 employees. But there's other industries such as manufacturing where the norm is more of 500 to 1500 or more employees that are still considered small businesses. So it really depends. The uh, there's And along with employment, there's also revenue requirements. So it's usually one or the other with the SBA. Um, and you can have, just for instance, in the retail sector, you may have uh, up to $9 million uh, to be considered a small business as a florist, but you can have up to $45 million as like a grocery super center. So it really depends on what your what your industry is. Um, the tax code has about 10 different criteria, potentially, total revenues, net income, assets, concentration of shareholders. There's, there's a, a really large um, spectrum here. And then when you look at something like the Family Medical Leave Act, um, which allows for paid leave, um, it says that over 50 employers. And so it really depends on who you talk to. Um, so by me going by less than five employers, we hit absolutely all of these criteria. And I guarantee you, you are considered a small business if you have less than five employees. So no question there. So here's part of here's part of the issue of measuring the number of small businesses in Idaho. So our our records only include those businesses who are covered under unemployment insurance. And so this often does not include a lot of sole proprietorships and partnerships um, where the the business ownership cannot be separated from the personal entity of the of the people that operate it. And so this graph is showing you a little bit of um, trying to use a proxy from the Secretary of State and see the businesses in good standing in the blue bars. These are businesses that um, renew their, their certificates of operation every year with the Secretary of State. Um, there could be a lag here as they only do it once a year, businesses could fall out. Um, but here's, here's kind of showing you a, just one brief idea you could see the orange is actually our number of active employer accounts. And when I say active employer accounts, this is um, meaning that they had at least one employee during at least one quarter um, during each of these years. If they did not record any employees for any quarter of that year, they were not considered an active employer. So looking at this, you can see that there is um, like a four to one ratio potentially of the businesses in good standing compared to our active employer accounts. And that if you look at the growth in the businesses over the last few years, you can see that we're adding 30, 40,000 businesses potentially a year. But if you look at the number of active employer accounts, we're growing maybe three to 5,000 generally. And so much smaller. Um, there's an estimate out there that about 80% of small businesses do not have employees. 
So what I'm going to be capturing with this data that we're going to be showing you is maybe those 20% that do have employees. So there's a, a big blind spot here of not being able to capture a lot of the really, the truly small businesses within the state. Um, but just to just seeing what they're doing here um, with our employers uh, should also translate to what they're doing statewide with those who don't have employers necessarily as well. Okay, so I, I hinted a little bit that we um, we get reports from employers if they are subject to paying unemployment insurance. And I just wanted to put that in here that there's probably a lot of small employers that may, may or may not know if they fall under whether they need to file for uh, be covered under unemployment insurance and pay those unemployment insurance taxes. Um, so I wanted to include this here. There's great resources at the Department of Labor, um, our UI um, can help walk you through if you need to set up an account, uh, determine if um, they are unemployed, I'm sorry, independent contractors or employees, um, great resources and great help. Um, the people here at Labor are really here to help you. They're not here to get you in trouble. Um, they'll help you understand the laws and figure out what you need to do. So just wanted to put that in there, um, that, for, that if there's anyone out there that's a little unsure, um, generally, you know, employment is if a service is performed and payment was received. And so um, it can get a little bit, a lot of gray areas for sure. So if you have any questions, um, go to the website, find a contact and, and just see if there's any help there for you. Okay, so diving in. So once again, so here's just a little bit of my methodology here. So this is comparing 2018 and 2023. And what this is doing is um, the way that I, I group these employers is I looked at every quarter individually and then I averaged them. So if they had five less than five employees per quarter, they would automatically be under the less the five employees. But let's say it was like a ski resort and they had 10 employees in first quarter and they had zero employees the rest of the quarters, they would still be included in that one to four because if you average 10 over four quarters, you get two and a half. So this is looking at a total year. And so just, just, just to give you that, that when you have industries that maybe you'll have a little more seasonal fluctuation, it might seem a little bit strange, um, but over the year, they still have less than five employees per quarter, essentially. And then this was also just looking at the other requirement that I did here was that they had to actually have employees during these years. So if 2018, they didn't have any employees, they weren't counted 2023 they didn't have at least one month of an employee or one quarter they weren't counted either so again these are active employers in idaho and what you can see here is the smallest employers make up 73 percent of total employer accounts in 2023 this is up from 68 percent in 2018. if you also add in the next bracket there so 5 to 99 so this is anyone employing fewer than 100 employees you can see this accounts for 99% of Idaho's employer accounts. So 99% plus would be well under that, under 500 employees. Um, this is pretty typical nationally too. You see that the, the, the larger employers make up a very small amount of accounts, but they account for a large amount of employment. So if you look at the right side, so the left side is the, the count of the firms, the right side is the sum of employment based on the size of these firms. And you can actually see that although the small employers make up 73% of accounts, they're only about 10% of total employment. And again, that increased from 2018. Um, all of these br brackets actually saw an increase in the number of employer accounts in the five years, but the rates at which they were growing was very different. And the fastest rate that we saw was in the one to fours. Um, but again, it's, those 500 plus, uh, their scale adds up quickly. You can see they make up a little over a quarter of Idaho's total employment, a tiny, tiny share of the number of firms, but a large fraction of the total employment. And just to put that a little more simply, here it is in a little different form. So again, you can see that those with one to four employees make up 73% of total accounts in 2023, but only 10% of employment while the rest um, make up about, again, about a fourth, but 90% of total employment. So scale matters. So when you have small employees or that are, that are opening up, adding one or two employees versus larger firms that are hiring 
one or 200 people potentially in a year, uh, it does make a difference as far as where that employment gets focused in on. Okay, so this is um, looking at the percentage by sector of which accounts had the highest percentage of those with less than five employees. So again, one thing I need to mention about my methodology here is that some employers um, report in multiple ways. For instance, um, we have some manufacturing companies that will report their production op their production companies, I'm sorry, their production workers um, in the manufacturing sector, but then they'll also maybe report their administrative or their executive team um, in more of the, the management of business sector. And I actually, I did combine all of these. So if they had the same unemployment insurance account number, they got combined. Um, and that's why these numbers here as well. If I didn't combine them and looking at a single quarter, it would have been more in the mid sixties for those being under um, five employees. But I felt combining them was appropriate because they are one entity. Um, but some of them I said, they, they have the same account number. They report a couple different times because there are differences in jobs that are, that are there. Um, so this is them consolidated by the same account number. So what you can see here is going from left to right, the industries with the highest percentage of what we're going to call the really, really small businesses in Idaho, those under five employees. Information is the top with financial. Financial activities includes banking. It also includes real estate sitting in there. Um, almost 90% of your real estate companies in Idaho hire fewer than five employees. Um, and then when you keep going, you have professional and business services. These are your, your architects, your lawyers, your CPAs. Um, also that management of companies as well. But I, I do want to mention that some of our largest sectors by employment are actually on the other right side. And so our top employment uh, is trade, transportation, utilities, and healthcare. Those are the top two. You can see they kind of sit in the middle. Um, but when we look at the sectors that actually have the lowest amount of employment and actually under 5% of total state employment within these small employers, we're looking at education, we're looking at manufacturing, and we're looking at government. Um, so those, you can see they do have a smaller share of, of small ones, but they're also... Um, overwhelmed by larger operations. So when you think of schools, you're thinking of school districts, you're thinking of often, um, you know, from a few dozen to hundreds of employees. And then, so it, it's kind of an inverse relationship here. Those, those um, sectors that sometimes have the highest percent is not always the largest overall employment sector. Um, information is actually fairly small with about 1% of total employment. Okay, so I did want to mention that I looked at this over one year, um, but I also wanted to see what happened when I looked at it in different seasons. And so what this slide is showing you is that some of these small employers, like I kind of hinted at earlier, have higher than five employees during certain times of the year, but lower than five employees in others. And so the, on the left side, we're looking at those that had potentially fewer than five employees in the first quarter. So in your winter seasons, uh, but possibly more than five in the third quarter. And some of these should not be real surprising to you. If you look at construction, um, construction has a lot of temporary layoffs usually in the winter. 95% um, of Idaho is in the winter months are is frozen under snow. Uh, I'm probably in the 5% here in Lewiston being the lowest elevation point in Idaho. There's some years you can golf year round in Lewiston, but not all of them. Um, and then, again, you know, you're going to see that accommodation food service, which includes your ski resorts. Um, it includes your water slides. It includes your fishing, um, fishing guiding, not not fishing as a as a job. Um, but then on the other side, if you look at, there's also some that have um, potentially more than five employees in the first quarter, but less in the third. And most of these, again, are kind of they're repeating. Um, but they're potentially different structures within the sector. And so the, I just wanted to mention that, that even though I'm taking an annual average, um, seasonality matters as, you know, with small employers, especially those who are working outside. It's gonna make a difference. Okay, so this one 
is a little different take. The little blue, the little, sorry, the orange dots are kind of what you saw before of the percent of the total accounts that have fewer than five employees. But it's organized this time in the total number of accounts that have fewer than five employees. And so you can actually see that professional and business services is the highest um, total number of, of employer accounts that have below five employees within the state of Idaho. And again, this includes your architects, your lawyers, your CPAs. Construction is next. When I compared this to 2018, actually, construction was number one. Professional and business services were number two. The top one in construction was just under 6,000 accounts. Uh, if you look at where professional and business services has gone, they're now at about 14,000 accounts. Um, this one grew by about 75% in the last five years and is now the top industry representation. Um, it accounted for actually about 25% of the small employer accounts that we saw. So one fourth of them were in professional and business services. Uh, we gained a couple thousand in construction as well. Um, but overall, you can see on the far right side, again, um, those low percentage of firms that don't have much, um, they, they're, they're a significant part of our, of our employment, but not generally real small. Okay, so when we look at the last five years again, um, you can see that on the, on, so this is employers and jobs. Employers are in the blue. So this is the count of number of employers by firm size. And then orange is the sum of the job change in the last five years. And if you look at the far right, you can see we gained about 20,000 employer accounts and 100,000, 111,000 employees in the last five years. And if you look at, again, the far left, um, the those who made up less than five employees accounted for 86% of jobs, but 18% of, jo of total number of jobs. So when you remember back before, they're only accounting for 10% of total jobs but they made up 18% of the job change in the last five years. And that's what boosted it up from 8% of total jobs in 2018 to 10% of total jobs in 2023. Is that we saw, you can tell by looking at this, that over three fourths of your total accounts um, growth was those in the one to four employees. And they actually had a very fast growth rate compared to the rest of the, the things. Uh, you can also see that you know, if you look at the average number of jobs per employers here, um, those in the one to four bucket, you're looking at just over one employee uh, versus, you know, if you're looking at the 500 plus, you're looking at, that's like 2,500 per employee. I mean, there's significant scales here going on um, that vary with the, the smallest and the largest employers. But by far, um, the smallest employers have really contributed the most to the growth in the last five years by number of accounts. Okay, so let's look, this is national. Let's look at, at a national trends here and, and see if we can explain what's going on, why there's so many small accounts happening. And so the blue line is the establishment count. And so this is your number of establishments. And what it is, is this is measuring those who are less than one year of age. So your startups, essentially. So you can see from 94 to you know, 2019, we were kind of sitting between 600 and 800,000 new businesses a year. But then something happened. And you can see that again, that once we hit 2020, and then 21, we kind of, we started going up over 800,000. And by the time we hit 22, we went over a million new establishments. 23, even though it dropped a little bit, is still at very elevated levels. The green and the red bars are the percent changes, the annual percent changes. So what this is looking at is the number versus last year. And you can see that during the recession periods, which are in the gray bars, um, you often see declines. You see fewer businesses starting up the next year during a recession, which makes sense. Um, but I also wanted to say that, you know, 23, it does show a decrease, but because it was at such a high level, we had annual changes from instead of zero to five to 10%, we had 20, 20 over 25% in 2022. That's a huge increase in the number of, of businesses that are young and just getting going. Uh, the pandemic really um, created uh, an unprecedented labor mobility in multiple ways. 
And one of them was some people decided that what they were doing wasn't wasn't really where they wanted to be going. And there was there was potential for new business ideas and innovation that happened. Um, but there was also the um I just lost my train of thought. I'll be right back. I'll be back. But anyways, but there was um also it just the really tight labor market created a lot of demand in a lot of different sectors. Let's say construction. Idaho is along with many, many states, we have a huge backlog of construction and we can't build homes fast enough. And so you're going to see people realizing that's an opportunity to open up businesses of their own. And so this really high um, new business is risky. Um, yeah, there's, when you talk about young businesses, um, potentially 20% of them will fail within the first year and about half of them will fail within the first five years. And so seeing all these young businesses, it, there is a potential that we could see a lot of business failures. Uh, there's also potential that that some of these businesses have really great idea and great capitalization, and they're going to just continue to grow. Um, but it is unlike really anything we've ever seen, but it also contributes to why it's so hard to find people these days. Um, when you look at also just how many new businesses are opening across the nation and across our state, um, those people were employed potentially by by a different employer, and now they've started out on their own. And so you have a limited labor force with more businesses competing for, for employers, employees. Okay, so here we go. So here we go, putting some visuals to this. So this is five-year chunks looking at 2013 to 2018 to 2023. So every five years. So if we look on the far left side, we've got those very small employers under five employees that we've been talking about. What you can see here is their growth between 2013 and 18, uh, 2018, 2023, the number of accounts that they opened more than doubled. That's pretty phenomenal in my mind. And then if you look at anyone over hiring over five employees, you can see that they did increase. They didn't double. They increased by about a third. From what they were in the in the previous five years. So when you look at the total, the real reason why our employer account growth doubled was all because of those who are hiring fewer than five employees. Not all because of it, but most of it. And then when we look at total employment, so what you can see here is that again, total employment change between 2013 and 18, we added 9,000 in the smallest employees, but we had about 20,000 in the last five years. What's really fascinating to me is that those with five or more employees actually gained about the same amount they did in the previous five years. Um, and then when you look at the total again, the total increased simply due to the number of those small employers that came into the space. Okay, so employer continuity. The, again, I have to talk a little methodologies just so you kind of know what I'm doing here. So employer continuity means in my, in my world that one, they had active employment in both 2018 and 2023. And two, they had to have the same account number. And so if an employer uh, changed account numbers, they wouldn't show up here. They would, they would show up as, as not being continuous. And what this is showing you is that based on 2018 numbers. So for those employers with one to four workers, what we're seeing in 2023 is that 58% of them are still active employers. This is a little bit lower than the statewide average of what we, was 65% in this period using this same methodology. Every time you, you increased your number of worker size, the percentage of um, active employers still employing workers increased. And so, so if you look down at the bottom, those employers with over 500 workers, 91% of them were still active five years later, um, which makes sense, right? Because most of your small uh, employers are fairly young businesses. Um, they, they're not real well established. And those really large companies don't just show up overnight generally. It's happened. But generally, there's, there's a time period and there's a journey for these businesses before they become the size they are. So less than 60% of them, it said, actually looked like they were still actively uh, employers. 
the, the thing I thought was really interesting as well as when you look at the next bar is that they really had very little difference in those that changed or increased employment. And from what I've from what I've seen, bigger employers are having better luck um, actually increasing their their employment. But at small employers, I think, are very um, when they decide to hire, it's it's a long term um, goal. It's not something they take lightly. It's something they've researched and analyzed and really, really tried to make sense to see if it's going to work for them. Uh, generally, when you are in an employer in this size as well, um, you're likely going to be in multiple departments, right? You don't have this. The, you don't have an advertising department and a and a marketing and a production uh, and HR. You're generally going to kind of cover some of those those different departments. Um, but it also showed that that they're not really necessarily any more likely um, to have decreased employment. More likely to not be around, right? But those who are around they had just as good a chance actually of showing an increase in play. And then on the far side, again, just kind of for scale, you can see that about 10,000 employers in this space. So these were employers that had fewer than five employees in 2018. It didn't, it didn't matter where they ended up in 2023. Um, but of those that increased, they added about 30,000 jobs. Whereas those, it took under less than 100 of these really, really large employers um, and they added about 20, 22,000 jobs in the last five years. So a whole lot more employers actually ended up adding more jobs than those really big employers, but it took a whole lot more of them to do that. Okay, so again, this is that same continuity thing. So if they were active employers in 2018 and then they were active in 2023, this is comparing what happened. This is not looking at those who fell out of my spectrum again. This is just those who were still active. And you can see that the, the, the small employers, I mean, they had a slightly lower chance of increasing their hiring, um, really had the highest chance of no change, of just staying exactly where they were five years ago. Um, and then decreased again. They're actually more on the lower spectrum. And, and kind of like I said, I think that they, they really it's not a decision they make lightly when they when they increase. It's for the long term, and it's um, they're not likely to fluctuate as much. They're likely to be much more stable than some of your bigger employers. Um, but it's also there's just so many of them and so many coming in as well that again, those that weren't there in 2018, we increased by about a third just in those last five years, we increased the number of employer accounts of those under five by about a third from what we had in 2018. So many of them won't even show up here because they simply weren't around long enough. Um, but it's it's definitely an interesting interesting thing with the, with the smaller employers. Um, often it's said that they kind of compete at a disadvantage. Um, and that's why you see them in a lot of, you know, small business exemptions and things like that. Um, because it, they they take up a whole scale, a large scale of our economy, uh, but they often, be, their, their scale and size um, is a bit of a disadvantage to them. Okay, so again, similar to what we saw last time, this is not continuity, this is just 2023. And just as a comparison of those smallest employers versus our largest employers in Idaho, you can see that the number of establishments is hugely different, 73% versus 0.2% for those over 500. But again, those over 500 actually make up almost three times as much of the state's employment as those with one to four workers. And again, this is only what I can see. Remember, there's about 80% of those small uh, sole proprietorships and partnerships that I actually can't see. And and U.S. as a total, they estimate that, that those businesses make up about half of the entire U.S. A labor force. And when you, again, when you look at account growth, it's it's significantly different. The the small ones, of course, are growing in mass and huge numbers, but this is what we kind of expect. It's nice to see that the big ones are still growing. They're just growing. There's not that many. It takes time. Again, these, these large employers take time. Many of our large employers started out as partnerships or sole proprietorships um, many, many decades ago, potentially. Um, and so it just it just takes time. And again, there's a lot higher failure rate with those who are small. Okay. 
So here's just a quick um, look. We're gonna kind of, a lot of this data coming up in the next bunch of, of charts is gonna come from the 2023 Small Business Credit Survey from the Federal Reserve. Um, and so they are are out there. This is a national basis, not, not just Idaho. But what you can see is that the highest percentage of firms that are less than two years old sit in that one to four employee space. We kind of expect this, right? Employees, they, they start out small and they get bigger. And then what you can see is that as you move the median age on the right, so every, again, every size as we go up, it decreases the percent of firms that are less than two years old and the median age increases. So the median age from those of up to about 19 employees is, is six to 10 years. Um, and But if you look at those largest small employers, so the 50 to 499, they have a median age of over 21 years. So they've been around for a long time. Another thing is annual revenues. So if you look at this, the with those with one to four employees, have half of them have annual revenues of of up to 250,000. So when you think about labor being a significant part of these operating costs, um, it's it's probably at least a good 70% or so of these of these firms' budgets. And so labor makes up a, a really big part of them. Um, the Bureau of Economic Analysis actually estimates that about half of those self-employed people um, have annual revenues of less than $50,000. But along with that, with smaller revenues, um, also means that you might be potentially operating uh, kind of by the skin of your teeth at times. And so in this survey, again, last year, this is showing you that a much higher percentage of your smaller employers are really strapped and, and kind of feeling stressed of continuing operations. And so almost two thirds of them um, aren't they're not saying they're operating great they're not saying they're operating well they're saying they're struggling and so when you start looking at some of the turnover rates here um you know for instance construction is has one of the highest failure rates in the first couple of years um, it's also one of what you saw one of the biggest increases it in, by total small employers that we saw over the last five years uh, professional and business services again has a fairly high failure rate, but was also the highest level of, of total change that we saw in the last five years. So um, there's a lot of risk that comes through here. Um, it's it's not uncommon for small business, in, small business owners to lose sleep but for many reasons. And this came in kind of small, but hopefully you can see it. I just wanted to, to point out the kind of the first on the first two bars here, your one to four employees at the dark blue on the far left, and then you get larger by number of employees as you move into the greens. And you can see that about 56% of your of your really small firms say that they're having operational challenges. But I also wanna show you that they're also the lowest percent that shows that they're having a hard time hiring or retaining staff. And I think that's fascinating, but I, it also goes back to that idea that they're more stable. They may not actually have been trying to hire um, during this time period, um, but they just, they're just they just more on a stable course. And small employers have some advantages for, for employees. They, they may have a hard time offering a lot of the benefits and the pay scale, but there's often um, a bit of a family there in that, in that employer. Um, as well as just quality of life and being close to home and potential flexibility on some of them as well. So, but I did want to highlight that those, they showed up a little different for, for small businesses on those. Okay, so here, this is um, comparing one to four employees versus 50 to 499 employees. So again, this is kind of your large segment of small employers versus your smallest employers. And there's not a lot of difference in them using their cash reserves, but what I really wanted to highlight is kind of the bottom half of this graph. So when operational challenges happen, what this survey is showing us is that your smallest businesses are much more likely to have to raise prices to obtain outside financing and possibly lay off workers. So they just, they don't have the deep pockets that some other employers do to, to, to ride downfalls. And sometimes it results in more extreme measures. If you look even at the very bottom here, you can see that 
27% of those with one to four employees potentially made a late payment or did not pay. And so they are actually falling behind um, and may affect their future financing ability as well. But there's definitely big differences. Even though these are both considered small employers, uh, potentially, there's still some big differences in how they are able to operate uh, day, day to day. Okay, and then again, this is really interesting to me because they look kind of similar, both sides. This is the last 12 months saying that, did your employment rise and then, or did it fall? And you can see that those with one to four employees actually had the lowest amount of rise, but they also had the lowest amount of fall. And they're actually, the employment, the percent that said it rose and the percent that said that it fell is essentially equivalent. If you add those together, a 45%, that means a little over half didn't change. And so I, I think that's an interesting sign that, yes, there, you know, if you look at it, if you were just look at the employment rose, rose sign, uh, you would say, you know, these guys really are not putting in that many jobs in the economy. But then if you look at the other side, you're like, well, they're really not losing jobs either. So I just found it really fascinating that that most of the survey results are showing these smaller employers as being more stable when it comes to employment, even though they have potentially more operational headwinds that they're dealing with. For the next 12 months, again, actually fairly similar. Lowest percentage, but higher than what we saw last year that actually rose. They're more optimistic, most most across the board, actually. Um, most all business sizes are optimistic that they'll rise. And then again, falling, um, the, the rates look lower than what we saw last year. So hopefully that holds. And again, those one to fours, um, have the lowest rate of employment falling potentially in the next 12 months. Okay, so those that earned operating profits in 2022. So again, you can see that they had a very, very small share here based on the one to four. Um, generally, when you're in this size employer, you're gonna be you're gonna be hit with materials costs, you're gonna be hit with labor costs. Um, but there's also, you know, the the demand for your product has to come in there as well. And small, smaller firms sometimes are harder to get in front of people and actually raise their demand for product and get themselves seen. They simply don't have the marketing and advertising budgets that some of these larger, larger businesses do. Um, but we are certainly seeing that a lower percentage of them were actually considered profitable in 2022. Um, and that is a big risk as a as a small employer. And again, that's why we see that higher failure rate happening is that um, less resources um, to go in all these different directions um, to not only counterbalance materials and demand and labor costs that are that are we're all rising together. Okay, so this one is is quickly um, close to about. 80% uh, of your employers are generally within a metropolitan area nationally. And between 2001 and 2019, we actually saw this number slowly increasing. It was about 79% of employers were within a, an MSA in 2001. We're up to 81% in 2019. By the time we hit 2020 to 2023, we actually saw that reversing and so what that means is you were actually starting to see more employers opening up in non-metropolitan areas following the pandemic than what we were expecting to see. So you were you were seeing a rate of almost five times as many employers within a metro area and non-metro area before the pandemic. And that has really decreased to less than two times um, the last few years. So the you're definitely seeing an increase in employers in more rural micropolitan areas versus the metropolitan areas. And what this one is showing you um, is that, if you again, if you look at that far left, uh, you have a much higher chance of having your, your employers that are one to four in your rural areas. So about 64% um, of, of employers with less than five employees are in a rural area versus 56% in urban. I do wanna mention though that that Significantly, again, like I said, urban makes up most of your total employment, whether it's it's small employers or not. Um, they have a significant amount of just total number of employers versus your rurals. Um, but likelihood is you're going to, if you're in a rural region, you're likely to have a higher percentage of small employers, which makes sense. 
Okay, so looking back more, we're going to keep going a little bit with this metropolitan, non-metropolitan thing for a few minutes. Um, so 15 of Idaho's 44 counties are classified within a metropolitan statistical area. So that means that 29 are not. And so these 15 counties, just to give you a comparison, they make up one third of our land area in the state, but they make up three fourths of our population and almost two thirds of our employers when you're counting by the number of employer accounts. And so they have a lot of sway. But I also wanted to mention that Idaho is a fairly rural and we're a fairly um, low population density state. And so I think it's important to note some of the differences here because things get skewed between some of our metropolitan areas and our non-metropolitan areas. So if I'm, I was looking in Idaho by 10 square miles, and what you can see here is that out of our 44 counties, 20 of them have fewer than three employers in 10 square miles. That's not one square mile, that's 10 square miles. But what you can see also is the metropolitan um, is actually dispersed. There's not um, necessarily all the metropolitan are in the, the most dense area, uh, but they do make up most of those that have more than 10 plus employers. So that would be one employee per square mile. Most of them are going to be in a metropolitan area. Okay, so again, looking at this, just to compare on the on the horizontal axis, we have the population. So this is again, 10 square miles. So this is saying that in 10 square miles, this county has a population between this number and this number. You see in the metropolitan, it's a population of almost 600 people and almost 20 employers. Your vertical axis is the number of employer establishments. So if you were to head to the right and up, you would have a higher population density and also higher employer density for those 10 square miles. But I wanna show you how distinctly different. So the metropolitan area, like I said, you're almost 600 people and almost 20 employers. But at your non-metropolitan areas, you have less than 100 people and less than three employers. And this is um, significant because again, we have 29 um, counties versus 15 counties. And it's, it's a huge difference. But when you average it statewide, it looks like we have, um, it's a, it's a, comes out to between 23 and 24 people per square mile and just slightly less than one employer per square mile. But again, significant difference if you're in a metropolitan area or a non-metropolitan area. Okay, we're just gonna continue on with this 10 square miles of Idaho just because I found some of this fascinating when you're talking about small business you think about your mom and pop operations, you think about your um, hardware stores, you think of your accountants. Um, so I wanted to just take a look and compare Idaho with the US and see what, where do we, where do we have similarities and where are we different? And if you can see here, um, this is based on 2023 population, by the way. Uh, you can see that the US has a population density four times that of Idaho for every 10 square miles. But it only has an employer density of three times that of Idaho. So really, if you'd expect them to be similar, uh, Idaho actually has more employers than you would expect for its population size. And I think that also, that also accounts to the fact that we have a lot of small employers. We're not um, a lot of huge employers. We're a lot of little tiny employers. So then I decided, I was like, well, you know what? Let's compare, just to give you an idea, just to show you how rural of a state we are. What if I add in all of the cows? I don't know how many of you know, uh, there's actually more cows in Idaho than people. And so cows, there'd be about 300 per square mile. So if we add that with our population, cows and people were about half of the US population density per 10 square miles, okay? But then I, I decided, I was like, you know, I'm done kidding around. I'm just going to shoot for the moon here and I'm just going to do something with potatoes because guess what? We're a potato state. Um, so if you add in the number of potatoes, we have 1.7 million pounds of potatoes per every 10 square miles. So add those together and by far, uh, potatoes, people and cows, we have a much higher population density than than the U.S. But that's just, I, I think it's important to show you just just these numbers that the U.S. is four times as dense as Idaho. And so when you think about U.S. averages and you read them, they're not necessarily going to actually translate to what we're seeing here in the state, and they're not going to be normal. Okay, 
So if we look at population instead of 10 square miles now, this is really where I think it got interesting. And so when you look at the number of employers per 1,000 population, on the left is private employer establishments, and on the right is private employer establishments with fewer than five employees. Both of them, Idaho has more employers per 1,000 population than the U.S. average, about a third higher on each of them. Um, and some of that might be that, you know, you could kind of talk about Idaho's entrepreneurial spirit, um, but it's also that we're rural. And so sometimes you, some people, you're going to have a higher level of self-employed people when you have, you know, you have your farmers that are out there in the middle of nowhere things. But, but I found this really interesting that per population, Idaho actually has more employers and, and it was not what I expected at all. I actually expected the opposite. And so seeing this kind of made me go, okay, this is cool. So small employers really are a huge part of, of our economy and they are a big part of who we are and where we're going. Um, but they're also, they're also a big um, foresight into what's coming. And so let's, let's talk about what's potentially happening in the next five years. Where are we going? So here's a little recap of what happened in the last five years. So the last five years, the number of employer accounts that had less than five employees increased significantly. We added 20,000 accounts and we went from being 68% of our accounts to 73% in 2023. We also went from being 8% of total employment to 10% of total employment as the this growth rate in this area of the economy was the fastest growth rate of all employer sizes out there. And they accounted for almost nine out of 10 employer accounts that got, that got added in the last five years. So they are, they are this engine that's, that they all operate on a different life cycle, but together what they're doing is they are creating a vibrant Idaho and they're creating a, um, innovation, but they're also making Idaho more diverse as well. So you, you're not focused in on a couple of employers. You have lots and lots and lots of little employers um, operating independently out there. But here's another look at what might be what might be coming. And so this is the small business optimism index. What you can see here, uh, I found again very interesting is that if you look at the period, the pre-pandemic period is actually when the small business optimism index was at its highest point in the graph. And you can see it's kind of just continued to drop from there. And comparatively, um, we're really kind of below that 14 to 17 area now, kind of more in that 11 to 14, which was, if you remember, uh, kind of coming after the Great Recession, things were in 2012, 2013, things were starting to gear up. Um, but small businesses are not super optimistic. And this is, again, a U.S. base. This is not Idaho. This is this is national as well. Um, but you are kind of starting to see that optimism fade. You did see, if you look up kind of in this, that 21 area, you see those big jump from the, from, from the pandemic. Um, and then we probably had a lot of uh, establishment growth. Lots of people um, were thinking that it was the time to start a business and, and this was the right opportunity. Um, but overall, you're starting to see small businesses starting to fear the future a little bit. Um, but I also think that if you remember just how many businesses we opened the last five years, there's a potential that some of these businesses may have really great ideas and, and live. And there's also a potential that some of them may not continue. Excuse me. So there's, it's a risky, it's a risky situation. Um, small employers, again, are the lifeblood of, of our economy, uh, but they are, their life cycle is also potentially more treacherous. Um, and those who succeed are are fewer than what we see as the larger employers. And again, um, looking at whether they're going to be hiring and can they hire enough workers on the left side, are they going to are they planning to hire? And you can actually see that um, again, you're seeing this drop from around you know late twenty one. Uh, it's just kind of been declining, still in a healthy state. I'd still, still say we're still between what 2016 and 2019, really. Uh, but the overall trend is down. And then um, can they hire enough workers? And so what this is meaning is that there was at least one unfilled opening. And you can see that not just for small businesses, but for everybody that during the post-pandemic period, it, it was got really hard to find workers. And you can see here that about 50% of small businesses couldn't hire enough workers. So seeing that come down is actually a really good thing. 
um, that maybe there's they're having better success as the labor market is is kind of lightening up a little bit. And that is a small business webinar. I'd I'd love to take any questions if you have any. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Um, um, thank you for uh, to our audience for attending. And if you have any questions for Lisa, now's a good time to throw them into the Q and A button at the bottom, not the chat, the Q and A. Um, and I'll just kind of fill in some time. I've got a couple questions for you, for Lisa, and kind of um, like what you were saying uh, in terms of like expectations and um, condition. It looks like Idaho is a good a good place for small business. It's it's certainly growing um, in higher percentages compared to 2018. Um, expectations might be a little bit um, conservative, I guess, to say. What's your What's your expectation for the future? Uh, and maybe like what what would be in your analysis what would you say um holds the future for idaho and small business you know idaho the last um couple of years has been phenomenal growth not only in population but employment and employment accounts um between 2019 and 2021 idaho had the second fastest change in employer establishments in the nation we added nine percent employer establishments and during that time we actually had the number one change in employment um, our employment gained by 12%. This was more than double the U.S. the U.S. average, and so Idaho, Idaho is in this really interesting situation right now with just this phenomenal population growth, but we've also had really strong employment growth, and I think it's going to bode well. But it also makes me a little nervous that we might have jumped into opening businesses a little early, or or situations have changed and. And we may also see some of those businesses, you know, that just maybe a little higher percentage than normal that that may not make it, but I hope they do. Um, but we've had phenomenal employment growth, and there's 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 no way that I can then make that sound miserable because it's not. It's the best thing around. Um, but I I I do think that changes are coming, and um, it could potentially um, it could continue. You know, Idaho can continue to lead the nation in both of these measures and both number of, of accounts and and employment. Um, but I think it's also going to just kind of stabilize as well. I mean, we were so above the national average that um, it, you look at most any graph and it was just, you know, Idaho looked like a skyscraper compared to, to the U.S. And so it'll be interesting to see. Um, but historically, in the last five or the last few years, even we've had phenomenal growth. And so I think we'll probably continue faster than the U.S., just maybe not as fast as we saw in 2019 to 21. Thank you. Um, we have one comment in the question. It's not really a, a comment, but I can partly it into a question here in a second. Um, just more of a, a appreciation of the information you provided, but also the humor and uh, cows um, and potatoes. Um, which, I, was, I wanted to make sure you were still awake. You know, I mean, how many how many economists add potatoes in when they're talking about population? So, you know, thank you for that. So, uh, which actually, my question was, uh, what besides uh, what's the one takeaway you'd like people to have from this besides the fact that they're going to remember the bit about um, so many cows and potatoes is for density? What's the other takeaway you'd want? Right. If you only remember cows and potatoes, the you know. But the, the real big takeaway that I want you to, to think about here is that Idaho is run by really small businesses. That's the heartbeat of our economy. And it's because that they've grown so fast in the last few years that we're really seeing the, the numbers of, it, of jobs, um, job creation is really being driven by those very small employers. And I, I want that to, to be the takeaway um, but to also realize that these small employers have different operating challenges and they have different needs than some of your larger employers. And so um, there may be opportunity potentially, um, whether it's through, you know, additional financing sources or better ways of marketing some of these businesses. I think there's ways that we as a state can probably help prop them up a little bit more and, and continue their, their growth and, and vibrancy. Thank you, Lisa. Well, I think with that, we'll we'll bring our webinar to a close. Um, I'd like to, well, actually, we have one question just got thrown in there. So um, uh, from your standpoint, what are the challenges and needs? Is, is there a way that city governments can help um, small businesses? Uh, yes, <laughs> there are. Uh, 
so small businesses, uh, okay. So the way that local governments can help, of course, is by trying to have conversations with your business owners of maybe where there's there's obstacles and blockades, and it might be in city code, it might be um, zoning, it might be permitting. Even when you're talking about business licenses, sometimes um, that can be a deterring factor for for some businesses to open up. And so I, I think there's also just just that view that that a lot of your small businesses really kind of are invisible and and having more feedback with those lo to that local business owner community, um, I think is is always a, a positive thing. But realize that again, some of them may need a little bit of help in their first couple of years, and it may not be financial assistance. It may be spreading the word about them. It may be just letting everyone know that they're there and they're functioning. And and sometimes it's things like that 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 maybe a small business doesn't have the resources to do, but um, but local organizations and, and governments may be able to help in that matter. Uh, would you care to answer that same question from a state government standpoint? Uh, what can what what are ways or suggestions for ways that state government can best help small business? Yeah, small I think state government, I mean, you're gonna wanna this is so broad, I'm sorry, but the idea is to to reduce those barriers, just like the Department of Labor reduces, try to, tries to reduce barriers to employment by by helping with resumes and 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 funding for retraining and things. If you can reduce barriers to small employers opening and continuing to operate and having a greater chance of being profitable um, and continuing, I think is probably the best move that that's possible. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then we have one question there that's uh, about micro enterprise grants. Um, I, I, I'm not sure who the source is, but is would five thousand be sufficient for um, small business as a micro grant? Um, I may refer you to the SBA for that one. I'm not sure that I have the best answer for that off the top of my head. I could certainly look into it, but the SBA, the Small Business Administration, would probably be a really good resource to work to to link up with. Awesome. All right. Well, I think that that's a good way to end it. So um, thank you, Lisa, for the information and everyone for the questions um, and for attending our webinar again. Um, I, I'd like to uh, let you know that our next webinar is scheduled for November 12th. Seth Harrington, um, our labor economist in the Twin Falls area, will provide a preview of the 2024 Idaho Business Climate Survey. He's working on the results right now, and so um, he'll be able to share kind of what that survey is re revealing. And then before we close, I'll just remind you that the Idaho Department of Labor provides free access to labor market information. You can get, at, get it at lmi.idaho.gov. Um, there you can get uh, a, a directory of uh, the regions and the labor economists in your area. If you just go at the top, data tools, select regions, and then there'll be a drop down for the region that you're looking for. Um, and the contact information should be there. In addition, there's a ton of tools there for you to look at. If you have any questions on any of that, just let us know. We're happy to help you navigate it and write in any insight we can. So again, thank you for attending. Um, have a great day and good luck with everything you have this month.